All right, so I'm gonna try another vlog here. What I've been doing on these blogs is just picking a topic that I feel I can talk about, turning on the camera and blabbing away and kind of seeing if anything useful emerges. It's a bit of an experiment. Um, sometimes maybe something useful comes out of it, sometimes it doesn't. I don't know. Uh, it doesn't cost me anything to make these YouTube videos, so it doesn't hurt to experiment. Um, what I'm going to do today is talk about something which is probably not of general interest. I'm going to talk about something related to my job, which is teaching English as a second language, or ESL, or sometimes it's called TESL, or TEFL, or I don't know. It's teaching English to people who don't speak English as a native language, either as a second language or a foreign language or whatever. Um, so, yes, I'm going to talk about activities that can be used for teaching any grammar point. This is useful for people who are teaching English as a second or foreign language, probably not of interest to anyone else. Uh, some background. Uh, how did I get into this topic? So uh, a number of years ago, I was working at a school where I had been teaching adults. And the adults were kind of easy to please. They showed up, they wanted to work hard, you give them some grammar exercises, they were perfectly happy. And then I transitioned to kind of teaching more children and teenagers. And this was hard work. They wanted a lot of games, they wanted a lot of activities. And I would, you know, get out the textbook, see what the grammar point was, and then be like, ah, oh, geez, how can I make this interesting? What's the game? What's, what, what's the game here? How does this grammar point lend itself to a game? And after doing it for a few months, I came up with kind of a list of reliable go-to games that I could kind of plug any grammar point into. Um, some, th these come from all over. Some of these are kind of classic ones. Some of these I got from my colleagues in the staff room. Some of these I thought of my, on my own, but like the only ones I can claim to think of on my own were like the really obvious ones that probably anybody could think of on their own. Anyways, um, so I, after kind of doing this for a few months, I volunteered to do a workshop on it to kind of share everything I learned with the co my colleagues. Uh, so I did I did the workshop at my school. I did it twice, um, and then I ended up doing it a third time about a couple years later after I had transferred to a different school. So the workshop. Uh, the first time I did the workshop. I put kind of all the activities up on a PowerPoint and I just kind of went through and put the activities on the PowerPoint and talked about them as, they, as I went through it and it was really boring but hopefully people got something out of it. Actually I, um, yeah, what, what I actually did is I had, I gave myself a 45 minute time limit. Uh, and then at 45 minutes I stopped talking and then I had the people in the workshop get into groups and kind of write down their own ideas and then they would present them. Because you know, whenever you get a group of, teacher in, group of teachers in a room, uh, everybody has their own ideas and you don't want to kind of hog the spotlight too much. Um, when I did this workshop again at the, uh, this, the next time at the different school, I got an idea to make this a little bit more interactive and a little less boring. What I did is I printed out all the activities and kind of posted them around the room. So people had, you know, I had put the teachers together with a partner, everyone had a partner, they had to go around and look at the activities, they had to figure out what activity what it was, what grammar points they could use it for. Uh, how long it would take to prepare, whether they liked it or didn't like it, whether they could use it in their classes. They had like a worksheet they had to fill out and they would go from activity to activity. So people would kind of walk around and look at these at their own pace. Um, so if you want to steal this workshop from me and use it in your own school, uh, 
that's what you want to do. Either do it as a PowerPoint or kind of stick these up around the room. I'll tell you what, I will link in the description down below to the Google Drive folder where I've got all the resources I used. Um, but so you can just kind of steal it and you know present it at your own school if you want. I tell them it was your idea. I don't mind. Um, for the purposes of this YouTube video, uh, I guess what I would do or what I should do if I knew how to use technology better was kind of make this into a slideshow and kind of record my voice over the slideshow. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. I, I just have a camera that, you know, point the camera, press record. That's all I know how to do. So I'm just going to kind of hold up some examples of the various activities. And I'm also just kind of going to talk through it and explain everything. Is this going to work? I don't know. Uh, this Maybe this will be really boring and not very useful to anybody. Uh, again, if you want to just click on the description down below, I'll have a dis written description of all the activities. If you want to just read this instead of watching the video, that's fine. We're, we're still friends. You don't have to watch the video. But I'm going to... I'm going to run the experiment anyways. I'm going to give it a go of just kind of explaining all the activities into the camera. Um, I'm not sure how long this is going to take me. I think this took me like an hour to talk about everything last time. This camera has a 30 minute time limit. So what I'll probably do is I'll split this into multiple videos, uh, maybe two or three or four, or however long it takes me. Uh, and uh, round about the end of 30 minutes, I'm just going to have to wrap up whatever I'm talking about so I don't get cut off by the camera. One more little caveat before we get started. Uh, I've decided to be as thorough as possible. Like all the ideas I've kind of ever gotten, I've kind of tried to put into this workshop. Uh, some of these are better than others. So uh, you can use your own discretion on this. My hope when I do this workshop is that kind of teachers will, will leave with just as many tools in their toolbox as possible. And then they can decide which ones are actually going to be realistic or th that they want to use. The other caveat is some of the things in here are basic, uh, like like just real basic activities. The first time I did this workshop, I had, for the sake of thoroughness, I had kind of put in every activity I could think of. But as I was going through the slides, I would kind of skip over stuff. I'm like, oh yeah, uh, running dictation. Everyone knows running dictation, right? We can just skip over that one. And then there'd be somebody in the room who'd kind of be like, well, actually, I don't know what running dictation is. Um, so I kind of assume that there are certain activities that every English teacher knows, but actually you, you can't assume that. Uh, it depends on who you did your CELTA with or where you did your CELTA or what your previous school was. Like different activities are popular in different staff rooms at different schools. But uh, I've learned over experience that even though there are certain activities that were really popular in my staff room at the schools I worked at, there's no activity that you can assume everybody knows. So I'm just going to explain everything. Uh, apologies if I'm explaining some of these basic activities that um, maybe most teachers already know. Okay, sorry, that was a long introduction. Let's get into it. So, uh, first activity, I'm going to go alphabetically through this. Uh, the first activity is the classic two truths and one lie. So this is, a, this is a party game. People use it as an icebreaker, as kind of the first day of class or, you know, as a game at a party. You say three sentences, two of them are true, one of them are, is a lie. People have to guess which one is a lie. For example, I have eaten horse meat. I have been to Hokkaido. I have gone scuba diving. Two of these are true. One is a lie. Uh, you try and guess. If you guess correctly, you can get a point. If nobody guesses correctly, I get a point or I, however you want to set up the point system on that game. 
Uh, now this is commonly used not as a grammar activity, but as just kind of as a get to know you activity, first day of class activity, kind of icebreaker type thing. But it totally can be a grammar activity. You just have to specify what grammar point you have to use in those sentences. I mean, the obvious one is present perfect, right? I have been to Hokkaido, I have eaten horse meat. But you, you, I've, I've used this with just about every grammar point. Three things you used to do, one of them is a lie. Three things you're going to do after class, one of them is a lie. Uh, three things you can do, one of them is a lie. Uh, this example here is the past perfect. So three things that you had done by a certain time. So I had something by 6 p.m. yesterday. Now, I made a little worksheet here just because I like making worksheets. Uh, you know, it makes me feel like I've produced something. But you don't actually need to make a worksheet. Uh, you could just kind of do it with scrap paper or you could do it without any paper. But in this worksheet, the students kind of have the structure of the sentences laid out. They've got five prompts. What had you done by 6 p.m. yesterday? What had you done by 9 a.m. this morning? What had you done by last Sunday? They write three sentences for each of them. One's a lie. And then the, in groups, the other people in the group try and guess which ones are true and which one is a lie. Small variation on this. You can use kind of a similar idea for contrasting two different grammar points. For example, going to in May. So things you are definitely going to do and things that you may do. This was a grammar point in the textbook I was teaching out of. They were, they were contrasting going to for future certainty, may for future probability. Uh, so same kind of general idea here, only you, you wouldn't read out the whole sentence. You'd have to say, I mm, watch TV after school. And then your classmates would have to guess two of these would be going to and one of them would be may or vice versa. Two of these would be one grammar point. The third one would be the other. Your classmates have to guess which is the odd one out. Okay, next, going alphabetically, the next grammar point that can be used for any activity is around the room memory game. So, for example, uh, imagine you're studying present simple third person S. So you say, I play soccer. Then the person next to you would say, I eat sushi, he plays soccer. And then the person next to them has to say, I like dancing, she eats sushi, he plays soccer. And you have the students in a circle and as each person goes around the circle, they have to remember all the sentences of all the people who came before them and then add one sentence of their own next to that. And again, this can be used for any grammar point. Things you did yesterday, things you're going to do um, after class finishes, whatever. Uh, it's, um, yeah. It just each person has to remember all the sentences before them and they all have to use the target language. A variation on this, this kind of takes away the memory aspect of it, but uh, has kind of the same idea of going around in the circle and kind of building on it, is circle writing. Uh, so somebody, you start off with a prompt, somebody adds one sentence in the target language and then like, the next person adds another sentence and the next person adds another sentence. I think the classic way you'd use circle writing is with, with the third conditional. So for example, if I hadn't overslept this morning, I wouldn't have missed my bus. Uh, and then the next person has to say, if I hadn't missed my bus this morning, I wouldn't have been late to class. And the next person has to add, if I hadn't uh, been late to class, I wouldn't have done badly on the test. And you just kind of keep building on that as it goes around. But the circle writing can be used for anything. Uh, all the things you're gonna do when you grow up, 
all the things you're going to do when you finish class, just any kind of target grammar where you can kind of build the story as it goes around. Okay, next one, board games. So, uh, you can create a board game here. Uh, this is a template I got from a colleague, which is uh, very nice and kind of professional looking. You start here and you go around here. Uh, this is one I just kind of made myself before I got the one from my colleague, where you just create a table and you have the arrows going. Either way, a uh, classic board game, you have kind of something to mark your spot, like a paper clip. You have a die or dice. You roll the die, you see the number on it, you go the number on the die, you move around the board, and the first person to get to the star at the center, or wherever the finish line is, is the winner. First person to get to the end is the winner, usually. Uh, now, I've got this divided into two types of board games. The first one is speaking prompts. So, for example, you land on a speaking prompt, you have to kind of make the question, and then somebody has to answer it using the target grammar. This is the present perfect. So, live in a different country. So, you land on this, you've got to ask somebody, have you ever lived in a different country? And then they have to respond kind of using the target grammar. And if you produce it correctly, you get to stay on the square. If you mess it up, then you have to go back to where you started from on that turn, or all the way back to the very start of the game, depending on how strict you want to be. Um, the other thing is, uh, so this is board game speaking prompts. You have a speaking prompt and you have to say a sentence in the target language. The other type of board game is where they have a command in the target language and you have to perform the action. Uh, so this is one with adverbs. So for this one, I have like a, I would cut these out and uh, make a, like a stack of cards. These are different adverbs, quickly, fast, quietly, loudly. And these are different actions. And you would land on the action and then pick an adverb card to tell you how you perform the action. And then you have to get up and perform it. Uh, I think, Board games with action prompts are a little bit more limited in the types of grammar point you can adapt to it. Um, but you can adapt a number of grammar points here. I have, I have another board game with modals. So you kind of, there's an action and then you pick the modal card to see if you have to do the action or if you don't have to do the action. So for example, it will say like, uh, sing a song. And if you land on sing a song, then you pick a modal and it says you must sing a song. You mustn't sing a song, you have to sing a song. Uh, and the, the, the modal card combined with the command determines what you have to do. Okay, next, board race. Now this is board race in the terms of like blackboard or whiteboard, you know, whatever that thing is at the front of the class that the teacher is writing on. Usually I think it's a whiteboard these days in most classrooms, right? So you have some sort of prompt, uh, which you either say, or if you have kind of a projector, you display it on the, on the screen. Uh, the students have to run to the whiteboard, uh, write the correct answer, and then the first team that writes the correct answer gets a point. The prompts are usually kind of sentence completion prompts, fill in the blank prompts, scrambled sentence prompts, something like that, where you, uh, yeah, you create some sort of prompt using the target language. Students have to, uh, I usually have two different teams, sometimes three, if, I, if it's a room big enough for three teams. One person from each team will go to the front of the classroom or to the back of the classroom. Uh, they have to kind of touch the wall. I give the prompt, they run, they write the correct answer. Uh, this assumes, of course, a classroom where you can run in. Uh, in my classroom, like the chairs are all along the edge of the walls so that they can run to the front. There are a few variations on this. 
Uh, one is a mini whiteboard, which uh, I should have taken a mini whiteboard home with me so I could demonstrate this. I don't have a mini whiteboard, but you can imagine. A mini whiteboard is a small whiteboard comes with like a small marker and a small eraser that students can write their answers on and then hold it up. So usually you put students in pairs or groups of three, you give them the prompt, the fastest team to write the answer on the mini whiteboard and hold it up gets the point. Another variation on that, something I got from a colleague called five star lineup. So in the middle of the room, you write down, you put on the floor, assuming you're in a school or classroom where you can write on the floors, you put five, four, three, two, and one. You give the students a prompt. They have to write it on their mini whiteboards in pairs. Then they have to run and stand on the number. So the first person to get to five, if they have the correct answer on their mini whiteboards, gets five points. The next person to run and get to four gets four points. The person who stands on three gets three points. So the teacher goes and checks, makes sure it's the correct answer, and writes the number on the board. Okay, next, brainstorming sentences. So this is where you give the students a prompt in the target language, uh, give them, put them in teams, or small groups, give them a time limit, and they have to write as many sentences in the target language responding to the prompt as possible. Sorry, did I say the prompt was in the target language? The prompt doesn't necessarily have to be in the target language. The prompt is just a situation. They have, but they have to write the sentences in the target languages. For example, uh, all the things that you must do at school. You have two minutes, go. They write them all down at the end of two minutes. You say, okay, how many do you have? The group that has the most sentences, uh, that gets the most sentences, is the winner. Of course, you always say, okay, we've got to hear them though. And you say to the other groups, okay, help me count. Uh, help me make sure these are all good sentences. And if you count them all up and the class agrees that they're all good sentences, then that team is the winner. Uh, again, you don't really need to prepare a lot for this. You could just kind of say, okay, take out a notebook. Here's the prompt. But I like to make the worksheets just so I feel like I've done something. So this is what I made on the second conditional. So I've got the prompt here. I've got all the lines here. I would cut this in half before class. Give this to each group. It says, if I were a horse, and then the students have to complete as many uh, sentences in the second conditional, beginning with, if I were a horse. Uh, then, if I were the teacher, is the next one. And the students have to complete as many sentences as possible using the second conditional. This also, this works great with any of the conditionals, first conditional, third conditional. Uh, the, yeah, things you must do at school, things you're going to do later today, it, it, yeah, it can be adapted. Things you used to do when you were a child, any grammar point really can be adapted for it. Okay. Next, choose your victim. Uh, no worksheet for this one because this one is not, it doesn't have a worksheet. It's a game you play with a ball. So you get uh, two teams. Uh, they stand up kind of opposite each other. So line up with kind of, you know, 10 kids here and 10 kids here. So they're kind of facing each other. There's a ball. They have to ask questions in the target language and then throw it to somebody on the other team. The person on the other team catches the ball, responds in the target language, and then has to ask a question of their own and throw it to somebody else. If they mess up uh, any grammatical inaccuracies, or if they repeat a question that's already been asked, then they're out. And the game kind of continues until there's only one man standing, no, not one man standing, uh, until one team has been completely eliminated. It's called choose your victim because you kind of get to choose who you're going to throw the ball at. 
I got this idea from a colleague who, uh, this was one of his favorite kind of standby games in his classroom. Uh, I've used it in my own classes. Um, for example, again, uh, present perfect. Have you eaten horse meat? Yes, I have. Have you been to China? Yes, I have. Uh, and it worked okay. Uh, it got a little bit boring because the students, maybe the grammar was a little bit too easy for them. They weren't kind of getting out fast enough. There was a lot of kind of standing around and uh, not a lot of people getting eliminated. I suppose if you up the challenge level to a grammar point, they found more difficult. It could be more interesting. I don't know. Okay, moving on. Next one is change chairs. Now, uh, this one, uh, you've got all the students kind of sitting in chairs in a circle and there's one chair in the middle. And usually the teacher starts the game. So the teacher sits down in the chair and the teacher will say, change chairs if, and then you put in the target grammar point there. So for example, present perfect again, uh, change chairs if you have read War and Peace. And everyone who has read War and Peace, uh, sorry, that's a stupid example, but, but you get the idea. Everyone who uh, has read it has to stand up and then kind of run around and get a new chair. Uh, and the person in the middle is also looking to grab a chair. So the person in the middle tries to sit in the chair of somebody who's just stood up. Uh, the, if the person, whoever doesn't get a chair at the end of it, has to go and sit in the middle. Again, present perfect is kind of the obvious one, but you can use this with anything. Uh, past simple, change chairs if you watched TV last night. Going to change chairs if you're going to do homework tonight. Uh, past continuous, change chairs if you were watching TV at 7 p.m. last night. Used to. Uh, change chairs if you used to play on the school soccer team. Any, any grammar point would work for change chairs. Uh, works great with kids. I've also had good luck using it for a, 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 my adult classes as well. Okay, next, classroom survey. Uh, this one's a little bit boring, but it works. It gets them out of their chairs. You, uh, you just have a number of questions using the target language. This, uh, this was a lesson on how, so how often, how long, how many, how much, how far. So how often do you take the bus? How many brothers and sisters do you have? You just have to go around the room, uh, ask four people for each question, write down their answers, uh, just kind of a quick little kind of mingle activity. Okay, next, crossword puzzles. So, crossword puzzle here, you've got the crossword grid here, you've got the prompts here, and they have to write in the answer in the target language. This is past forms, but this, that's, um, that's a bad title. Uh, this is actually contrasting the past simple with the past continuous. So they have to read the sentence, decide if it's a past simple or past continuous, and write it in the crossword. There are, in this day and age of kind of internet wonderland, there are a million different websites where you can kind of make these uh, crossword puzzles for free. Um, okay. Actually, sorry, I'm gonna stop it here because I'm coming up on the 30 minute time limit. So when I start video two, I'm gonna start video two kind of continuing to talk about crossword puzzles.